John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of only the fa- only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness all ha- we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, lead us to be in your word and to see your light. Bless us, Holy Spirit, that my words would be yours, and that our hearts, our minds, and our lives would become what you want them to be. Father, together we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If I can get my first graphic up. I have a question for you guys. What's on the screen? Darkness? Nothing? Well, there's not nothing. I mean, I haven't captured the void and put it on a screen. Jesus. (laughs) We'll circle back to that answer. Nothing, blank screen, black screen. Uh, I assure you something's there. I made this graphic myself. I can tell you guaranteed there are at least three elements involved, and only one of them is the black background. But the reason that I've put it up here like this, very intentionally, is because in in our reading from John, we're introduced to this metaphor where Christ is the light of the world. But before that, Kind of call it in our in our base state as people. This is all we see of God. There is too much sin. There is too much darkness. There is too much confusion in our lives to see anything. And what's more, I think we can kind of broaden this out a little bit. And this image gives us an analogy for the state of humanity after the fall. We fell short of where God's intentions for us were. We fell short of what we were supposed to be. And this is where we were left. And we say, well, can't God just kind of come in and and part the veil and show us everything? Well, He could. But I think maybe a, a helpful way to think about the revelation of God is in the context of a relationship. When you meet someone for the first time, most of us, the normal way to do this, is you do not share your deepest, darkest secrets with them. Right? You don't go up, hi, stranger, I'm meeting in the airport. I have a real problem stealing from people. Like, just little things, things that don't, they wouldn't really notice, but like, that's something I really struggle with. How are you today? That's not how you introduce yourself, Right? You don't say, here are all my strengths, my weaknesses, my vulnerabilities, my sins. Uh, Here's what I really struggle with in life. And by the way, here are my existential crises that I have today. That's not how you introduce yourself to someone, right? Where do we typically start? Hi, my name is... Slim Shady. Oh, Lord. 
that wasn't in the that wasn't in the manuscript. No, you start with your name, and and maybe you start with some things about you, like depending on where you meet the person. So if you meet someone at a kid event, right? Your kids are playing soccer or they're in a play or whatever. Maybe you talk about your kids a little bit. Or if you meet someone at the dog park, you talk about your dog. Or if you meet someone at a bar, you, I don't know, talk about your favorite beer or depending on how long you've been at the bar, maybe you do start with things you shouldn't share with people. Um, and from there, maybe you go and they get to know you a little bit, right? You share, oh, here's some of my favorite places to eat. Have you tried this restaurant nearby? And, and it's still pretty impersonal, but it's a little bit more about you. And if it goes really well, if you're hitting off and you're like, this person does seem normal, I'm not at risk, they're not a serial killer, maybe you exchange phone numbers. And maybe you meet and you, you have dinners and you spend more time with them, whatever. And for a lot of our relationships, right, that is about as far as it goes. They know where you like to eat. They know a couple surface level things about you. And you talk from time to time when it's convenient. Now, every once in a while, you do meet one of those people who they become one of your close friends. And you do go beyond that. And you start to learn more and more about them. And eventually, you do share the things you're struggling with. And you ask for their support on things, and you say, hey, I'm really having a tough time with this. Can you support me in this, or can you keep me accountable? But most of us don't probably have more than a handful of people that fall into that role. Because it takes a lot to get from not knowing someone to that level of trust. And when we talk about knowing God, it, the comparison there is okay. And I say it's okay because it's only one-sided, right? God it has no concern, he has no vulnerabilities, no fears, no deep, dark secrets that he has to keep from us, right? But on the other hand, sometimes it, it, we have to trust that he's going to receive us before we're willing to admit our vulnerabilities and our sins and our brokenness. And what's really cool is if you look through history, if you look through the Word, God's willing to meet us there. And He's willing to start with us there. And what we see in the Old Testament, what we see in the written Word of God, it's as if we took this image we have and He just shed a little bit of light. on A little bit more. And I experienced this. I know in the back, maybe this is still just a blur, but can someone who's closer read that for me? Right. It's still a little fuzzy. It's still a little broad. But when we look at the history of God working with his people, especially in the Old Testament, in the written word, this is what we see. God does love his creation. He is invested in taking care of his people. But some of the other things we learn is that he takes sin very, very seriously. And the other thing we learn, if we look through the Old Testament, is that he keeps his promises. God follows through on his word. And this is a beautiful thing about the written word of God, is it starts to introduce us to God, so hopefully we can reach this place where we're willing to be vulnerable where we're willing to admit and go before him with real repentance and say, hey, I know I'm a screw-up. I need you to forgive me. And that's where we start to get into John. Because John, he has some weird language to start this gospel, right? He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later it talks about the Word becoming flesh, and we're like, what on earth is that supposed to mean? Well, in theology circles, we have a name for this. Because he's talking about Jesus Christ. And we say Jesus Christ is the personal, incarnate Word of God. So we have the written Word who starts to show us who God is, and then we have the personal Word of God. And what Jesus Christ is, is He is the fullness of the revelation of who God is and what He intends for you and for me. When He teaches in, in his earthly ministry, he is teaching, this is the fullness of what God wants for you in this life. 
And when he dies on the cross, and when he rises from the dead, he says, this ultimately is what God wants for you. This is who God is. He is someone who loves you so much that he is willing to suffer and die for you. This is who God is. He is a God who loves you so much that he has paved the way for you to spend eternity with him. So when we talk about the personal word of God, when we talk about this light of the world that gives us grace upon grace, that makes us worthy to be children of God, it's as if someone took this image that we started with and added just a little bit more light. Jesus acted on that love at the cross for our redemption. And especially those of you in the back of the room, you might be looking at this and say, hold on a second, this is, not, this is still not clear. In fact, you all the way in the back, you might be like, is there anything on that screen? I promise there is. And the reason I do that is because even though we know this, even though we have this revelation in the personal word of God, the reality is we all still have lives. We all still live in this world that is broken, where there is loss, where there is suffering, where there is sin, where there's darkness, where there's confusion. And a lot of times, all of that stuff that surrounds us, it can make it really hard to see this truth. Maybe, yeah, we know that Christ acted on the cross, that he loves us so much, but sometimes the world that surrounds us makes it really hard to see it. And that's why it's such a blessing that we don't just have two two forms of the Word of God. Besides the fact that two is a much less satisfying number uh, than three is. Um, We have this third Word of God that John alludes to here, and we call it the spoken Word of God. And most fundamentally, when we talk about the spoken Word of God, we talk about when God speaks into people's lives, right? In the, in, we, when Moses is at the burning bush and God speaks to him. When God speaks into creation and things are made. When God speaks as Jesus to his disciples. All these, yes, are spoken. But the other places we see it are right here. When the word of God is read, right here, when the gospel is proclaimed, when forgiveness and and everything else that comes along with the word of God is proclaimed. We hear the spoken word in the groups that meet on a regular basis. When these people who know your lives, who know what you're going through, speak to you and say the word of God as it applies to you. Even smaller that it happens when you're struggling and you talk to that one friend who is that close to you and they speak the truths of God into your life. In all these ways, it is the spoken word of God that in some ways is the most intimate to us because it applies directly to us and our lives and where we're at. That's why this time we spend together on Sunday mornings is so important. That's why our time spent in groups and with Christian friends is so important. In fact, it's critical because what it does is it takes this image and it cuts through the dark. And it clears out the confusion. And it removes all of this, all of this that the world fogs up our lives with and it makes it crystal clear. God loves his creation, including you. And Jesus acted on that love at the cross for our redemption. You see, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have these three words of God, and the Holy Spirit works through all of them to cut through the noise and to bring the gospel to each and every one. Amen. Now may that light of the world reach into every part of our lives and bring us closer every day be rooted in the gospel and walking in our faith. Amen.